Well, thank you so much, choir and, and orchestra. What a great job they did. Wasn't that amazing? I think uh, Dwayne has just done a fantastic job in the time that he's been here developing our music program and uh, enlisting more people and, and just working on that. And, and we're, we're uh, receiving the, the benefit from it today and other days as well. So it's great to see that. Today we're going to be in the book of Exodus. Last week we looked at Exodus chapter 5. In Exodus chapter 5, we kind of got a glimpse of the nation of Israel being in bondage in Egypt. And the book of Exodus really kind of divides pretty evenly between two sections. There's the first part where they're in Egypt and there's this showdown between God and Pharaoh and then God's people are brought out of Egypt. And then there's the second half of the book which really focuses on God's revelation to Moses and giving the directions for the tabernacle that was to be built. And so today we're in Exodus 31, we're looking at one of those sections dealing with the tabernacle. So the tabernacle was uh, the precursor to the temple. It was the, the mobile, movable version of the temple that was first constructed. And it was, it was a tent. It was a very immaculate, elaborate tent, massive in size, but nonetheless it was a, it was a tent. And as the nation of Israel moved through the wilderness and moved on into the promised land, it would go with them everywhere that they went. And God's presence dwelt in that place. I think sometimes we have trouble understanding the Old Testament passages and what some of the Old Testament people were dealing with because we are so familiar with the New Testament and the fact that we know what all the sacrifices pointed to, that's Jesus, and we have experienced the benefit of Pentecost and the Spirit coming and living and dwelling among us, that we forget that people did not always have this complete understanding and knowledge, nor did they have our experience with the Holy Spirit. And so in the Old Testament days, prior to Christ coming and dying on the cross, prior to him rising from the dead, and prior from the Spirit coming, the Spirit would move at times. The Spirit would come upon leaders to empower them. But people did not experience the dwell, indwelling presence of God like we experience it today. God dwelt in the tabernacle and then later in the temple. And so when we begin to think about the, the, the tabernacle, we, we can't relate it today to the, to the New Testament church building. It's not, there's not a correlation there. For today, you and I, as believers who've been born again and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we, we are the temple of God. The Bible says this in multiple places in the New Testament, that we are the temple. And so when we begin to understand that the tabernacle had such a central place in the life of these people because it's the only place where God dwelt. God was one step at a time throughout history undoing all that was lost in the fall when Adam and Eve sinned against God. Remember, Adam walked in the garden with God and talked with God. He saw God. But sin destroyed all that intimacy. Sin destroyed all of that fellowship. And so God was one step at a time restoring this to, to us. And as the tabernacle was built, this was one of these phases in God's movement. In which the tabernacle was built and the Ark of the Covenant was placed inside the Holy of Holies and on the, the mercy seat on the very top between the wings of two cherubim, two, two angels. God's presence dwelt. And so for the first time since the fall, God came and physically dwelt among the people. Now the extraordinary thing that we're looking at today is that God used two ordinary men to construct the tabernacle. 
two very ordinary men that God gifted with extraordinary abilities, but those gifts came from God, not from, not from them. God used these, these two men. And I think if you read the Bible, you'll see a pattern from beginning to end. Is that God, who has so much ability, he can speak and bring the world into existence. The same God chooses to use us. He chooses to use us for his purposes in the world. He chose these two men that we're going to look at today, Bezalel and Aholiab, to build the tabernacle. Later, he would choose men like Isaiah and Jeremiah to be prophets. Later, he would choose men like Matthew, Peter, James, and John to be apostles. And today, God is still using people. The way that God works, we see it all throughout Scripture, is that God appoints people. God calls people. And he invites us to join him in his work. And so today as we get a glimpse of how God used these two men, we, we, we all need to be reminded that I believe with all my heart that God wants to use us today. He wants to use us in a different way. There's no longer a need to build the tabernacle. There's no longer a need for Old Testament prophets to speak to Babylon or Assyria. There's no longer a need for New Testament writers. But at this time, and in this place, I believe that God wants to use us in a way that's just as extraordinary to build his kingdom and to bring people into relationship with him. So I hope that you'll be greatly encouraged by today's message as we get a glimpse of how God works through people to accomplish his will and his purpose. Exodus chapter 31 is where we'll be. I want to ask you to join me in standing as we read this together, Exodus chapter 31, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, in carving wood, to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Oholiab, the son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan. And I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you, the tent of meeting, the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is on it and all the furnishings of the tent, the table and its utensils, and the pure lampstand with all its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the basin and its stand, and the finely worked garments, the holy garments for Aaron, the priest, and the garments for his sons, for their service as priests, and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense for the holy place, According to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. Let's pray together. Father, I just give thanks that you use people. And Lord, we come before you today as your creation. We desire to know you as our creator. We desire to be called to service just as you called these two men. Father, we pray that you give us a heart that's obedient and receptive. Use us according to your will and for your glory. For it's in Christ name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, one of the beautiful things about this passage is that we see that the Lord calls people by name. The Bible says in verse one and two about this first man, he says, and the Lord said to Moses. So, so the Lord is meeting with Moses. He's given Moses all these directions. And he says, see, I have called by name Bezalel. You notice he said, I've called by 
name. And then later in verse six, and he says, and behold, I have appointed with him a holy ab. Now I know that sometimes these names are so foreign to us that, that we have a hard time relating. But, but, but these people just had names common in their time. I mean, he can call them James and John or Bill and Bob if it helps you to relate to them better. It's just ordinary people, people that God called. And about the first one, he says, I have called him by name. The second one, he says, I have appointed with him a holy ad. Now, what we see in this is that the Lord, he is the one who chooses who he uses, where he uses them, and how he uses them. Out of all the people in the nation of Israel, it was God who chose that these two men were gonna construct the tabernacle. Bezalel was gonna be in charge and Aholiab was appointed to work with him. And then God gave all these other people ability to come under and to work with them. The same is true today. Do you know the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 18, this passage the Bible's talking about here about different spiritual gifts, different gifts in the body of Christ. And here's what it says. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. So the Bible says here that if you have the gift of teaching, it is not because you desired the gift of teaching. It is because God chose to give you the gift of teaching. If you have the gift of hospitality, it is because God chose to give you that gift. And God has arranged us all within the body. In fact, Paul, in describing these spiritual gifts, he compares them to the physical parts of the body. Just as we have eyes to see and ears to hear, these different parts of the body each have a different function and they all work together. One is not more important than the other, but all is essential for us to be healthy and functional. And in the same way, God called these men, Oholiab and Bezalel, he called them and he gave them a specific role to play. He did not call them to write the scripture as he did Moses. He did not call them to serve as priests as he did Aaron. He did not call them to be preachers but he called them to be craftsmen. Because it takes all of these things working together to accomplish the will of God. And we see throughout scripture that it's God who calls. He says that he called Bezalel and appointed a holy app. Two different words to describe the same process. It means that God chooses whom he will use how he will use them, and where he will use them. It is God who chooses. I fear today that we've lost a sense of understanding of God's call, especially as it comes to vocational ministry. I have people who constantly ask me about this, and young men who are struggling to try to figure out, is God calling them to ministry? And I have the same advice to all of them. I always tell them, if you're not sure, don't worry about it. If you can go home, sleep at night and rest, go sell insurance, build houses, whatever it is that you want to do, if you can do that and be at peace, then go do that. Because I've never seen anybody that God called and used in a tremendous way that had any doubt about their call. When God calls people to ministry, it's certain. It's certain. The Bible describes, one Old Testament prophet describes God's call in his life as a fire in his bones. He just couldn't be content until he'd done what God had called him to do. And so when he asked the question, Pastor, do you think my son would, would be a good preacher? Well, not if God's not called him, he, he won't be a good preacher. We need to look to God for our place in his kingdom. He is the one who decides who is the missionary and who is the pastor. But you may never thought of this before. But this passage teaches us that he also decides who's gonna be the craftsman. You see, we have, in many ways, have this misunderstanding 
of what it means to be used by God. Now, although some people don't quite understand that God calls people to be pastors and God calls people to be missionaries, in the same way, they don't understand that God calls everyone to some form of service. God has called us all to be a light in the world, all of us. And these two men, they were called to be craftsmen. There was a man uh, in Atlanta. He was a retired, uh, he was a retired um, airplane, or aircraft mechanic. He'd been one of the lead aircraft mechanics for Delta his whole life. Went to work there as an early man, or early in his life, served his whole life, retired. So we were doing, we were doing a little work together one day and I was asking about his, his experience. And I said, I said, I said, why, I said, why did you choose that path? Why did you choose that career? And he says, well, I think that's what God had for me. And I said, really? I said, did you, did you enjoy it? He said, I did. He said, I loved every minute of it. And he said something that you don't hear very often from lay people. This, this man truly understood this. He said, he said, pastor, I believe God called me to that. Just like he called you to preach. He said, why would God call somebody to be a craftsman? Because how are we going to be a light in the world if we're not in the world? Do you know the Bible teaches us that we're to do everything for the glory of God? And that includes fixing airplanes. That includes selling things in retail. That includes being a CPA. In, in every aspect, in every career, God has placed us strategically all around the community in all these different families and God intends us for us to be a light wherever we are. It's not just pastors that God uses. God uses people in every segment of society if only we will allow him. And the beautiful thing about this call of these people is that the Lord called them by name. He called them by name because his call is, is personal and intimate. The Bible says in Exodus 33, this is just two chapters later. The Lord said to Moses, the very thing you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight. And listen to this. And I know you by name the Lord is still calling people by name not just Bezalel or Holiab not just the disciples he is still calling people in fact in the New Testament Jesus said this Jesus as he was using this metaphor of, of the sheep pen and to talk about his, his followers as the flock here's what he said to him the gatekeeper opens the sheep hears hear his voice listen to this and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out Oholiab and Bezalel they are mentioned in scripture once once and only once the Bible doesn't tell us anything about their background it doesn't tell us anything about them that nowhere in the New Testament does it refer back to these men and yet, God included their names in Scripture as he revealed to Moses the two men that he had called and appointed to build the tabernacle. Because you see, the Lord knew their name. It was intimate and it was personal. And the Lord knows your name as well. He knows your name. And he has a place for you in his kingdom. He has a place for you to serve, but it's an invitation. You have to decide whether to receive it or not. You see, I believe that God wants to use us to build this church, to build other churches. I believe that God wants to use us to help people come into his kingdom and understand who he is. I believe that God wants godly school teachers to be an influence in our system. I believe that God wants people in, in every aspect of business being a light to the world. So God not only calls people to vocational ministry, but God can call us to all kinds of works of life. 
You see, the Lord fills people with everything they need to do what he has called them to do. So look what it says about these two men. Verses one through six says, the Lord said to Moses, see, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Now here's what it says. I have filled him with the spirit of God. We're quite familiar with that. It's not a surprise that God calls somebody to some form of service. He would fill them with the spirit. But, but notice what else he gave them. With ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship. As we begin to think about this list that God gave these people, it says that he not only filled them with the spirit, but he gave them ability and intelligence. He gave them knowledge and craftsmanship. Many people today would say, well, Pastor, you don't get your intelligence from God. It's, it's genetic. The Bible teaches that it's God who created everything, including our genes, our genetic code and DNA and how we reproduce. Everything that we have is a gift from God. And God is able to give people what they need to do what he has called them to do. And in this case, he gave them not only the spirit, but he gave them ability and intelligence and knowledge and craftsmanship. And so notice what he says, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, in carving wood, to work in every craft. And then the Bible says in the second part of verse six about a group of unnamed men, and I have given to all able men ability ability. So what we see in this passage is that God did not call these men because they were skilled. He gave them skills because they were, they were called. They were called. I think sometimes when we think about the idea of God calling us to some area of service, whether it's a Sunday school teacher or a deacon or being a Christian influence in the minds we think, I, just, I, can't, I can't do that. That's, that's, I, I just don't have the ability. That's, uh, that's just too, too much for me. I'm not able. The truth is, is that on our own, everything that I just said is true on our own. God is not calling us to do something because we're so incredibly valuable. We have some skills that he can't live without. It is God who gives us all of our skills. It is God who gives us ability. God did not call Solomon to be the king of Israel because he was so wise. God made him wise because he was the king of Israel. It was Solomon's prayer as Solomon asked for wisdom. And God said, because you've asked for this, I will give you wisdom to rule my people. And so when we get to understand this, the things that God is calling us to do, he gives us the abilities that we have to do what we need to do. I think it's so important for us to all recognize that we are, we're all very different people. One of the tremendous flaws, I think, that many of our uh, people that are writing in church leadership, writing in church growth, and, and all the evangelism, all these different areas, is that they assume that everyone is the same and if someone is doing something over here and it's being effective, then all we need to do is imitate it over here and it'll be just as effective. God doesn't work this way. He's created us all unique. We all have different personalities. We all have different spiritual gifts. We all have different abilities. And we all have different levels of intelligence. God has uniquely created us and designed us to fit somewhere in his kingdom. And God is not calling you to be a light where you live because you're so bright on your own. God is calling you to join him in his work. And he gives us the ability to do what he's called us to do. There was years ago that a young man that God had called to preach. He, he had no education. He had no experience. But God had saved him. He had had a, uh, he traveled on the road in country music. He got into a drug scene. 
and lived very wildly and God saved him out of that and God called him to ministry and he's had a heart and desire to follow the Lord and his call. There was a church that ran about 30 up in the mountains that called him to be their pastor. And I got to know that young man. He, as I said, he had, he had really no, no natural ability and no education and no training. But God called him and he was faithful. And I saw God use him on more than one occasion in an extraordinary way. I saw a man that preached beyond his ability because God gave him what he needed to do what he called him to do. You see, I think if we'll learn to trust God and depend upon him, he'll show us how, how to be a light in the world, how to do what he's called us to do. This is what wisdom is. Wisdom is applied knowledge. It's the ability to apply knowledge and understand how to respond and what to do in the world. And so God did not call these people because they were skilled. He gave them skills because he called them. The Lord not only gives people spiritual gifts, but he gives them all kinds of gifts and abilities. He gave them this ability to create uh, things out of gold and silver. They say, well, why would God do that? Because that was what was needed in the moment. God wanted to construct the tabernacle. And so he needed artisans that had the ability to build these things. And so he gave them the ability and he gave them the gifts. It's tempting sometimes, I think, to be nostalgic and to look back at other times and think, if only we had lived in such a time. Friend, it is God who has decided what time we were born in and when we would live. And every generation has unique challenges. As we think about where we are in salvation history, we are in the church age. God has called us and placed us here. It was by his sovereign will that we weren't born during the Exodus, nor during the time of the Old Testament prophets, nor even during the early church. God has chosen to put us here. And there are unique challenges that we have that no other generation has ever had before. Primarily advanced by technology, things that people have never had to deal with before. but this is no surprise to God. And he can give us the wisdom and ability to do what he's called us to do, even in this age. You see, as we work to serve the Lord, we work according to his plan. I want you to notice the second part of verse six. And I have given to all able men ability, and here's why, that they may make all that I have commanded you. Skip down to the second part of verse 11. And it says, according to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. The tabernacle was not Moses' idea, nor was it Bezalel and Aholiab's idea. It was not their design either. It was God who decided there would be a tabernacle built. He decided what it would look like what it would include and how it would be built and how it would be moved and how it would be used. It was was God who decided this. And when he called these two men to service, he called them into service according to his plan. It's so important that we understand that we are not asking the Lord to join us in our work. He is calling us to join him in his work. And so as we think about the church today, the age in which we live, the church, the church is not our design. It's not our invention. It is the Lord's plan. Jesus said that he would establish the church, and so he has. Today, the church is found all over the world. People are gathering, sometimes in beautiful buildings like this, and sometimes huddled up in homes and under trees. But wherever there are people that have been saved by God, by faith, who have been filled by the Spirit and come together as a body in that local community, we have a church. And this is by God's design. And so as we think about what what is our place in the church, our place is whatever place he's called us to. See, he's given us all kinds of different abilities, and he did it for a purpose. Because there's diversity in the body that we 
as we come together, all these gifts and all these abilities and all these areas of service, they all work together, just like parts in a machine. And it's when we all work together, doing what God has called us to do, how he's called us to do it, in the place in which he's called us, this is when we see the church functioning as it should. We serve because this is God's calling. We serve on God's terms according to his design and his desire. Friend, when we begin to understand that, that God called these two men, as far as we know, just ordinary average men, Bezalel and Aholiab. He called them by name because he knew them. He called them by name to have a role in his salvation history, that these two men would oversee the construction of the tabernacle. And later he would call other men. He called Peter, Peter who was an uneducated fisherman. He had no status in his own day, but the Lord knew his name and he called him by name. He called him to be a disciple. And we look back through history and we see other people that God has called and used in amazing ways. And today, I believe with all my heart that God wants to use us here and in this place. So our, our place is not to say, God, here's what I can do for you. Our place is to say, Lord, here I am. Send me. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that despite our sin, our weakness, our imperfection, that you choose to use us according to your will to build your kingdom. Father, I pray today that we would be obedient, that our heart's desire would be to seek to fulfill your desire and your call upon our life. For it's in Christ that we pray. Amen. As we close today, we're going to sing a song of invitation. We sing this song in order to give us a chance to respond to God. And I want you to understand this. Every single person here today, God knew you'd be here today. He knew the moment that you would be born. He knows the moment you're going to die. He knows you by name. And one of the most beautiful things that we see in the Bible is that even though he knows everything about us, he still loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us so that we could be saved and we could be used in his kingdom. And so I want you to understand this today. God is calling us all by name. I believe every person has a time in their life and the spirit begins to convict them about their sin. And the spirit begins to draw them unto God. And we have to make a choice whether to rebel or whether to listen and respond. And so I want to invite you today. If God has spoken to you and you understand your need for him, would you just call out to him in prayer? You see, the reality is that every single one of us, we're just one prayer away from all of our eternity being changed. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is God's plan and God's promise. It's not ours. And so today, if you'd like to claim that promise, today, all you have to do is pray in faith and believing. Just admit to God that you're a sinner. Ask for forgiveness because, friend, God wants to use you. Maybe here today and God's been speaking to you about something else in your life. Maybe God has been prompting you to some area of service. Maybe you have a gift that God has given you that you've hidden instead of using. I want to invite you today, just search your heart before God. Let's all speak honestly before him. And if God is calling you to anything, would you please respond to him today? 
If you need someone to pray with you or help you make a decision, that's why I'll be standing here at the front. Let's stand together as we sing.